So I'm going to read some very straightforward poems. I think. The first one is called 1918. It, it's a, it takes place in Hope Cemetery, or around Hope Cemetery. 1918, a sculptor was tapping eyes out with his chisel, slipping sinews in the forearm, his patron twitching in anticipation of the weight of granite sitting on his corpse. I like to walk around the cemetery because the inhabitants urge people to bring them flowers so they do nothing, and their families argue about the proper way to acknowledge. The row of children lost the flu epidemic, an angel, a tree of life, a bench to rest on. The next three poems are from a book that I have coming out in July with 30 West Publishing. The Fifth Winter of My Grandmother. Her father tied her to a sled and walked quietly through the snow to leave her with a distant relative. The song of the runners, the creak of the crossbar as he pulled, an owl above his now clear, now distant figure as snow shifted around him. Her father didn't die, not then, but disappeared in the same woods. It was her mother she searched for, her mother who had plucked the oldest and the youngest to leave, and reset the table for four, a blue water pitcher, roast potatoes, salt pork. No matter how many times my grandmother cooks the same meal, they never take her back. 43 Howland Street. When my father waved goodbye, sobs bent him bowed over his cane while the car of his children disappeared. Terrible fear is love with its constant seizure of assurances. Long ago, walking in the early morning in Belgium, his pack chafing his shoulders, his rifle jostling, he couldn't see the next stretch, quiet except for the feet of his platoon pattering, and the sleepiest river gliding over its worn bed. He thought he had lost the weight of himself. Eulogy. My mother spent a long time, like 15 years in a nursing home, and I visited her once or twice a week. And it was difficult, as you might imagine. Eulogy. I take the corpse of my mother out. The ground is dry enough for her to shuffle safely across the parking lot. She squints and admires the gulls, if they are gulls. I'll cry when she finishes slurping out her rare words, and some other her can be summoned as partial, as extinguished. My mother lived so long McDonald's died. The five and dime migrated to the dollar store, and the drugstore lunch counter forever closed its gray for my good stall. <coughs> Singles night. She bundles herself around the last beer and watches the man at the next table tap his finger with a pencil as though larding his skin with thought. And another woman stroking her knit vest and the weave of her hair. She is a reader of seams because she arrives secondhand, an animal pieced like a quilt. High Holborn Street. Sounding like a river in spring, the man with aphasia calls the dog, and the dog brings a stick, a bone, whatever's left over from other dogs. His neighbor, the hospice nurse, is coming home from her late night shift and rehearsing the soft thunk the freezer door will make when she reaches for vodka and glass. The man with aphasia goes on calling the dog, conjuring specks of his former life. The nurse nods at him, wordless. Early mornings exhausted, houses empty, the street hushes, and the moon is fading. <clears throat> I spent many years working in human services. And a lot of it was just being a witness to, to tragedy and suffering. So this poem is mostly about 
those experiences and also teaching at Community College of Vermont. Chase. What happens in late winter is a car goes off the road. An EMT with a shiny forehead arrives first. The car slid into a ditch filling with icy snow melt, and the driver, an older woman, is trapped. The driver's door held closed by the bank, and the car is filling with icy water, and the woman is saying, help me, and touches the blood on her face. He doesn't know how to break the window. A fire truck arrives with a hammer punch, and he says, watch out, and taps and taps until the window breaks. The woman is cold and her leg is caught. She's baffled by the blood. Help me, she says, help me. He's holding her head out of the water, and he's saying, stay with me, stay with me. The water is cold, his hands ache terribly as the water rises, but she's just sleepy now. People say, stay with me because our stories are lonely. The EMT and I go on telling stories until someone promises to stay through the night, though we know they can't. When I was on the playground with a mute child coaxing, a staff member ran across the brown lawn shouting, New York is bombed, the towers are falling. I thought, drama queen? But the radios were blurting through the barns and general store, and the upper grades couldn't imagine a building taller than the three-story Coca-Cola plant. The total dead in New York would mean this village and the next two hamlets would empty. The story of mismatched socks, strewn lunch bags, and the unraveling sleeve of the worst girl vanished. Scale matters in a tra tragedy, the size of absence and smaller tragedies invisible. A war veteran in my class had been driving in a convoy when the guy in the back tapped him on the shoulder and said, look out. He was turning his head as the shell glided through his shoulder, but it took the center of the guy in back. I loved his scarred head and the stories of his childhood and the careful voice in which he gave up and disappeared. That's what it means to be lost, your story muffled by the transit of bodies shuffled from battlefields. On a husk of stained carpet in a rented room, in a warren of rent rented rooms, I was watching a baby stretch. I traced this baby several times, the father in jail, the mother on the run. But I kept calling, and now I could see he looked like his grandfather. 20 years ago, his grandfather worked for me before he raped a client and went home to his wife reading the newspaper and shot her. His two daughters endure the state's care until one of them dies at 16. I can't tell you her story. I don't know if anyone was listening. But the daughter that runs and keeps on running, I want to tell her, as though he was reaching out from prison to strangle her, don't let him win. But a cliche won't release her from the terror blanketing her. I keep waiting her for her, but she's not here today. Just the new daddy, just the young daddy, newly on, on parole. Is this how you hold him, he asks, her child born strung out and wandering himself. Help me, I say, the EMT and I pacing by the side of the road. The EMT is watching a woman speeding around a blind curve, and the woman on a side road here somewhere being shot by her drug dealer and so on, always just behind me. The EMT is kind enough to share my haunting and hold my head. But will there be a, a memorial, a black wall, a reflecting pool? The EMT and I bring our tools and push through the detritus of lives that never really began, then return to our good dinners and walks afterward across the park. The enjoyment po possible from a shared meal and a walk, the way love and hope are sustained by ritual and utterly beyond transmission. What I would really say to the mother of this baby waving at a shadow is I don't want my hands frozen in a cradle for the dead. I'm not sure where we are, but help me look for another exit. Maybe I would match her footfall for footfall, kicking at the substrate. Public tragedies offer some mutual island. When the Challenger blew up and blew up on the wide TV of the group home I was working in, no resident had an IQ above 20. The lot of us, voyagers covered in miles of space and scraps of burning cloth orbiting the planet. Adornment is the ear of culture, an echolocation of place, so we don't forget where we belong. I hurry to keep in front of the ambulance or the convoy, not knowing what station I'm headed for. I imagine the sound of the sirens is always around me. Up the road from me, an apartment burned, containing a young acquaintance and her boyfriend. 
I mean, the ambulance went past my door and the smell of smoke drifted down. I'd seen her a few days before, admired her second baby, and imagined the future contained her, but not me. The neighbors could hear them yelling for help, pounding on the walls. When will I stop hearing the ambulance go by my door? You're probably wondering about the trajectory of the orphans, of the burning parents and the grandparents, the anarchy of loss, and then keening forward over the years. Not everyone reunites with the living. When my mother died, she wasn't more lost to me than she'd been before. Schizophrenic, she was unappeasable and never said stay with me, though she has. One more poem. This poem is a complete shift in tone called a tragedy in three acts, and it isn't. One, I was driving past Walmart when the transmission fell out of my car. Two, it reminded me of bumping my suitcase up the steps of the Greyhound when the cover sprang open, festooning the passengers with my underwear. Three, at school we played polio victim. The smallest, I was daily lugged by grieving classmates from tarmac to apple tree where a miracle occurred because I didn't want to be the main corpse. Thank you. <laughs> and I will now introduce Ralph. Ralph and I went to school together really, really a long time ago. <laughs> and I think you babysat Jason, yes, and I babysat one of his sons. My oldest kid. <laughs> we go back a long way. Ralph Culver first arrived in Vermont in 1970 to do his undergraduate studies at Goddard College in Plainfield, right down U.S. Route 2, where he focused on creative writing, literature, and studio art. He has pretty much remained in Vermont ever since. He currently lives in South Burlington. His latest book of poems is A Passable Man, published by Mad Hat Press, in 2021. Thank you, Sam. And the kid we were just talking about, the, uh, Jason turns 50 on May 1st. <laughs> um, I'm totally disorganized, but you know, I've I'm at the age where I don't care anymore. <laughs> Good for you. You know, I just, I just don't care. Um, uh, first things first, I, uh, Palm City Montpelier is just the greatest celebration of National Poetry Month in the country, I think. And it is such a delight to be here, uh, to be back at the Kelly Hubbard and uh, being a part of this. Um, I did want to mention, though, we've had a couple of really big losses in our um, poetic lineage in Vermont just within the last few weeks. Um, Norman Duby who was born in Barrie. He uh, went to God, did his undergraduate work at Goddard, and I think he got out in 65, which was five more years before I got there. Um, but he worked, I, I never knew him personally, but we worked with a lot of the same people. Um, he passed away uh, February 20th in Arizona, and it's just a fabulous poet, and totally genuine in every, and unique in every respect. And then um, a very good friend uh, and a mentor of mine, and in fact he was the, um, he was the faculty um, clinician <laughs> for, my, for my senior study at Goddard, uh, Barry Goldenson, um, who uh, died just a week or two ago. Um, in New York, and I just wanted to mention both of those men because I, I'd like to celebrate them. Um, so the first poem I thought I would read is from my book, which uh, is here. If anybody's interested, you can see me after the reading. 
uh, which is a poem of solace. This is called Memento for my friend, a carpenter whose father has died. It's dedicated to Erhard Manka. When you are in your car driving the darkening road and the sadness strikes you, when the lost face rises from the shatterings of rain that uncoil a pale wine across your path, when you are eating your cold lunch by the half-finished houses and something leaves you and you take up the handle of the hammer and close your grip on it slowly, slowly, when in a moment there is the sea change, a draining of blood salt that harrows your eyes to fire and water and your cupped hands await something that never comes. Remember, do not ever forget that the road you take is taking you under the quavering stars, that the rain is a thing you wear in your hair like dew crowning the trees in summer, that the houses are patient, the nail is straight, the hands are in no need of waiting. That your eyes are the Father. They are of the world and are not. And their seeing bears you across the world and the water to witness what all is not lost. Um, this is a recent poem, but it's dedicated to the memory of Norman Duby, so I thought I would read it. Uh, and it, it talked about a changing tone. This poem dedicated to the memory of Norman Duby. Norman Duby, by the way, was a very, he had a very dedicated uh, Buddhism practice. And there's a, a word in here, zazen, which many of you may know, or if not, I will tell you it means zazen is sitting meditation. This poem dedicated to the memory of Norman Duby. This poem dedicated to the memory of Norman Duby begins, like every poem, with silence. Not the silence of the instant before the meditation bell is struck, but the silence the gong of the meditation bell rides upon into our ears as we sit zazen wondering, when is dinner for fuck's sake I'm starving, thinking I'll do anything for a cigarette right now. The body flies off our bones, which become meal for the earth, Doobie said. Mark Strand was asked if he wanted to still be read after he died. He replied, I'd rather be alive after I die. <laughs> this poem's called Dancing Down Broadway with My Bottle of Brandy, and I'm going to read it. It's dedicated to my friend Danny Seidenberg. I'd like to read it for Jack and Marge, uh, in particular, who are here with us today. Dancing Down Broadway with My Bottle of Brandy for Danny Seidenberg. One, sober, you continue to be repulsive. Another, she in green, senses the need you sense and pivots, pursuing an immediate elsewhere. Turns one eye to the topmost of two pulses wed at her wrist, confirms she's history from either approach. What it is, it's, you think, too obvious. Things tend to support this conclusion in spite of your demand for little, if not nothing, from any. Then, her buttressed foot, discerned at the logical end of the last glance, falls without thought just beyond the potential glee of a fresh dog pile that squats dead center in a streetlight's wisdom. You think of vaudeville and several Eastern religions. You think life is basically stupid. You go home with this weight, fat with retreat, and break out the last bottle. Two. You skiffle on the rain-spat paving, swing the amber-dancing club about your head, a warning and a benediction. Dread confines. You've finished with it. Now you wing your way through these convenient double doors, approach the bench. Two close-clung counselors take brief stock of their virtues. Compromise is obviously ordered. His and hers, their dewy steins announce. McNally's eyes appraise your burden. His fat finger points at your specific self. He smiles. 
The joint's just closed, he says, as far as you're concerned. The chatter dims. If nothing else, you've learned when you're not wanted. Your teeth by the girl's feet, you envisage a matched set of pearls, broken and scattered in some jug room fray. Your company in hand, you turn away. That's that. Back in the street, the rain dies quietly, an old pain sparks. Two men waiting for a bus, a drunk snores in his swollen clothes, the obvious again, speaking that rough, unquiet diamond. And of the other, of love, there is never, never enough. a prose poem called Lesson. She poured herself a glass of water. The act of retrieving the glass from the cabinet and filling it from the kitchen tap, letting the water run across two fingers until she was content with its coldness, and then holding the mouth of the glass at an angle to the silvered stream as it steadily filled, had satisfied her thirst more than if she had actually drunk from it. She set the glass down gently on the kitchen table, then just as deliberately seated herself within reach of it. The sides of the glass tall and narrow, tinted Aegean blue, her distorted, expressionless face. She considered the glass. She considered containment, mass and volume, how they are in some ways the same and yet utterly different. Mass, the amount the glass carries, volume being the space the water occupies. And she thought suddenly and unbidden that her entire life to that moment had been spent holding grief within herself, although grieving what or for whom she knew she could never fully comprehend and that it didn't matter in any case. A gout of grieving, and yet oceanic and entirely captive within her. She dipped a finger in the water and brought it to her lips. Then she rose and, tipping the glass slowly, emptied it into the sink. Uh, Li Bai is a great Chinese uh, poet who liked his wine and the moon. Uh, he's a, in the West, he's often known as Li Pao or Li Bo. This is, this, oh yeah. this is called Lamentation of Another Evening Wasted, after we buy him. The wine jug, oh, there's a little, Pro there. yeah, there's a little, little on dude out there with a stick. Yeah, I see on the oh, okay. Just trying to get our attention. Exactly. Lamentation of Another Evening Wasted, after we buy him. The wine jug has been filled and emptied, filled and emptied. My lips alone have kissed its wide, wet mouth. Leaves of torn and crumpled paper scattered about the chamber, covering my feet. An entire night of raising a cup to beg the moon's blessings, hands blackened with ink. Stain of autumn moonlight on my writing desk, stain of forsaken verses on my fingers, a night of drunken lines mourning my drunken days. One page worth saving. If I thought I could make it back to my room, I would drag my body down to the banks of the Yangtze in the awakening dawn and let this single sheet set sail on its waters under the branches of the red maples. This is called Cohen of the Sort. Folks know where the Cohen is. In Buddhism, it's sort of a, what a Zen monk would tell you is like a knock on the forehead to wake you up. Cohen of a sort. The sounds of water as she rises from her bath while I slice bread in the kitchen. How can I still feel sorry for myself? <laughs> <clears throat> Yet somehow we managed to. 
Um, Sam's former babysitting charge, my son Jason, will be 50 on May 1st. I don't know how that happened. Um, this is a poem called Boy at the Plate. Um, not the dinner plate, but the baseball plate. So since the season has just started, maybe it's appropriate. Um, boy at the plate for my children and for my parents. Spread, the boy's legs are unsteady as tent poles in a squall. It is useless to tell him, I know what this is waiting on someone who seems as near as the end of his reach to give him his chance at shame. That he hardly believes it is himself. I heard that voice in my head so many times it became a weapon, the only weapon I had. It is useless to tell him the same voice splits from the throat of the field mouse, rearing up to teeth as long as its own forelegs, useless and wrong. For now, the boy must believe he stands in the mouth of the first fear birthed in the world. Later, in time, perhaps while watching his own and shaken by the glory of it that it is, he will see for himself the common fear, the common love he fell out of, now into, and watch, and love, and be thankful. A couple more, a couple of new ones. Um, I do want to read this. Uh, this poem is for Hill. Uh, it's dedicated to her. It's called Her Heart Morning, M O R N I N G. Her Heart Morning. The roses have used up their time on earth. Well, for now. In five months, spring will have its say. But today, the snow has changed everything, hiding despair and promise equally. The light, increasing from the east, frames her at the window as she looks down on the featureless yard beneath its white, obscurant mantle. What to feel, she wonders, that space in her chest non-committal, even though she senses how much the man in the bed behind her loves her. What to feel when what we have is good and still not wanted. She understands. She desires a sign, a cardinal alighting on the branch just beneath the sill. Maybe the dog will bark or a rabbit will cross the yard by the trunk of the maple. In the meantime, waiting, she sees just clearly enough that she needn't choose despair or promise one over the other just now. His breathing is even a constancy. Her own breath Fogs the window pane. And a couple newer poems. I've often wondered. I've often wondered if, over time, I've kissed every square inch of your body. It troubles me to think that there might be even the smallest portion of you my lips have not honored. I imagine you giving off a steady, telltale glow a saffirine iridescence, any place my mouth has come in contact with you, making it easier to isolate and identify those minute segments that have suffered from my unintended neglect. There, an unlit spot the size of an 11-point lowercase o between the third and fourth toes of your left foot. <laughs> Hungrily, gratefully, I lift your lustrous ankle. <laughs> You opened me. You opened me with your lips, your hands, your intuition, in service of the heart as much as pleasure. Those two facing books from the same, I'm sorry, those two facing pages from the same book. The evening sky is opening for the moon. It had been a long time since I had felt such awakenings. The density of light and concomitant shadow more than a thing broken being made whole again, a replenishment, the way houseplants that have been neglected accept the offering of water. Not a new thing, but the essential thing done in a new way. All the incertitude in me set free by your rapturous eyes. 
And I'll finish with this. This is called Every Morning. Every morning that he awakens, it is into a sense of wonder. I'd like to dedicate this to my friend Keith up in Grand Isle. Every morning, every morning that he awakens, it is into a sense of wonder, or perhaps more accurately, incredulity. He has been given another moment of waking, which is this moment. He assesses his gradual re-understanding of and recommitment to being. He tests his perceptions, the light limbing the edges of the window blinds, dogs sleeping at the foot of the bed, cat sleeping at the head of the bed, woman sleeping beside him, a gladness in him for these things, joyful, all made more acute by the understanding that a final waking awaits, the distance between this and that moment narrowing. Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Sidney Lee. He is Emeritus uh, Poet Laureate of the State of Vermont, 2011 to 2015. Uh, he's also the recipient in 2021 of the Governor's Award for Excellence in Arts, which is the highest award that the state can give a person in that particular category. Um, and he is, uh, he is, his book, is it here that you brought? Did, which book did you bring today? Here? Uh, yeah. Okay. So he the, he brought his book here, a collection of poems, which is uh, on the back table for sale. And he has two books coming out, uh, a collection of poems called What Shines, and uh, a book of essays, Such Dancing As We Can. Sidney Lee. Realized that uh, I met these two young poets. Uh, <laughs> always talk about age, you know, at the end. Uh, on page, uh, Sam in person for the first time today, and Ralph, uh, I, uh, in Sam's case, uh, we're putting together uh, my successor as poet laureate, Charles Newark. I remember, I'll never forget the phone call when Alex Aldridge was at the uh, Vermont Arts Council and they called up and I asked me if I would accept being a poet laureate. And I, the only person in the room was my then 16-year-old daughter. If you have 16-year-old daughters, this will resonate. I said, be poet laureate of Vermont. He said, I think it's pronounced low rate. <laughs> so, a little humility never hurt anybody. <laughs> and uh, Ralph I encountered when I was the judge of a chapbook contest and I have followed his work with avidity ever since that uh, passable uh, man book available back there is well worth uh, your investment. Um, I'll read a few poems my fingers to work, from, uh, from this book here, which uh, came out with exquisite timing, uh, just as the uh, Nation walked down for a little bit. But, uh, at all events, uh, I'll read a, a few from there and a couple from the forthcoming book and then a couple even uh, more recent uh, than that. Uh, the first one is, is called The Owl and the Eye. My, my father, I've meditated on this quite a bit in my older years. As, the country makes less progress than one wishes it would. Uh, he was the uh, company commander of a, a company of so-called colored troops in World War II. A lot of people don't realize that it was until after the war that President Truman integrated uh, the armed forces. And he was stationed of all uh, unfortunate places before going overseas, uh, to Wales and then to Normandy. At, uh, in Gadsden, Alabama, um, and he made a great mistake of uh, doing something that this poem will, will report on. Once the Jim Crack cross got burned on a lawn, my mother took off back north to heaven. My father was stationed in Gadsden, Alabama, before the Second Great War. 
commander of so-called colored troops. And he'd invited a few of his men inside the house, it seems. A radical thing indeed, just then in the heart of Jim Crow Dixie. So my mother escapes giving birth down there, though I don't have any idea why I think of this, which near to her death she spoke of so many years after. Why now, on watching a barred owl glide to a hemlock going dark at sundown, everything else is well going dark around me here where I stand. Once, at midnight, she thought she'd heard a whoop of human anguish and wondered whether some soldier was being lynched outside. My father went for a look but found nothing. My lifelong relations with my mother were vexed, I now suspect, in part because between us two stood a lot in common. The Jews were being crammed into cattle cars to stand but for dad and those troops, the evil in Europe, lay several months ahead. Still, real or imagined, that cry of mortal misery stuck with mother, though no signs of nearby violence turned up next morning. The company came en masse to mess. Shit on a shingle, as the GI said, dried beef on toast. So life went on, at least for a while, more or less. It ought to bring comfort that I'm where I am, aging but safe, my kid constantly swelling as sons and daughters produce their sons and daughters. And winter, so harsh this year, giving way at last to spring with snowdrops clinching the freshest making their reminiscent cascades through the woods. I recall how my beloved this season, the wise and this lonely sensation. It feels that I'm in some pitch black tunnel and won't get out again, that this is, as the saying goes, it. That all I'll have at the end, of course there can't be anything to it, is the sorrowful eight note anthem of that single owl the sound that just now, having reached my vexed old head, though it would be foolish to think that song was addressed to anyone human. In 2016, I was, uh, in my old age, uh, my, well, at my young age, when I was about 60, I realized I could not, uh, I couldn't uh, run using their verb somewhat loosely uh, to stay in shape anymore, and so I took up in a fit of what that same daughter called geezer madness, uh, the competition, the uh, flatwater kayak competition, which I continue to do. Um, and uh, I was, I, uh, we have a camp up in Washington County, Maine, and, and uh, I was training for this and feeling very good. I was uh, 73 years old, and I feeling very good. I have a little pinch up here. Uh, not during any of the workouts. It was a 12 mile race, and I was practicing at nine while I was a race mile. And uh, came back, and uh, it, it wouldn't go away. It wasn't very painful. It didn't have any, any shortness of breath or dizziness or anything like that. On the other hand, both my father, grandfather, and great grandfather all died in their 50s of coronary troubles, and so my wife without whom I'd be living in a cardboard box down here in front of the firehouse, um, I suggested that I might want to have it looked at. Mount Hunts and Howard in a close clinic. So we drove, he said, well, you, what are you going to do? So I drove down there uh, in Callis, Maine, on the New Brunswick border, and uh, had a blood test, and I said, well, you're having a heart attack. I said, well, I can't be having a heart attack. This is not like any heart attack I've ever heard in my life. I said, you're having a heart attack. So three hours later, I was down in Bangor, and uh, I had a stent put in, and uh, I've since uh, felt better than I did when I didn't know there was anything wrong with me. So uh, I'm still on the right side of the grass. But this is a, this is a uh, I, I noticed when I put this book together, and I don't buy into the notion that poetry is prophetic, least of all mine, but I noticed when I was putting this collection together, there was a lot of uh, poetry that had to do with uh, physical presence here, it's called here, that's, that's what the uh, title implies, is being here, uh, which becomes a, you know, I'd rather to be alive after, uh, after I'm dead, uh, that I'm not uh, 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 
dead yet is a, is a fine thing, and I, I found myself sort of celebrating uh, my capacity to enjoy the hereness of here. And uh, then I had this uh, event, and uh, it, this is the final poem in that book, it's called Here Itself. Um, because most of the poems were written before this, uh, before this incident. And uh, the inscription is from the uh, Eastern Maine Medical Center Patients Report, 8-21-2016. The losing stent placed an occluded right coronary, or coronary artery of otherwise fit and pleasant 73-year-old male. <laughs> Guess which of those adjectives my wife had, had some pause over. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, that's the uh, inscription. I had a heart attack, it's something I kept on thinking, when he hears from others. In search of dazzling revelation, I wandered blind through the world and begun to see as much. Having approached Paul's barber shop, for instance, down the same asphalt alley in the same old hard scrabble hamlet, and through the same old waiting room with these copies unchanging of guns and ammo, popular mechanics, what have you. I contemplated the ancient jug of Lucky Tiger, Paul's horseshoe pitching trophies, the snapshot curling around his tacks of the 350-pound bear at his bird feeder, and Paul and myself, right there in the mirror, as ever. Forty years and more he's been cutting my hair as it's dwindled. Three full de four full decades of identical questions when he's nearing the finish. Wet or dry? Shall I do the eyebrows? A little more off the top, trim the ears. Of course, he knows the answers. It's the right, that's all, and a very comfort. Wonder lies in minuscule things. I'm here. There's a tough, late solitary dahlia in our flower garden. A hooded meganser drake is grating like a rusty hinge from our pond. I notice these things, it seems to me now I haven't before. I felt no fear, just wistfulness for wife, children, grandchildren, friends. I had a dress rehearsal for death, but no, no terror. Strapped to a gurney, I went off to visit the wonderful isness of was. The issue isness of forever. An Indian summer paddle trip on my beloved Connecticut River. Reflected below, crows cross the water to disappear behind a scrim of yellow leaves, cottonwood, silver maple. I can't quite describe it, but here I am to see it. I push through the windrows of lustrous fall foliage on the surface. There, above the village steeple, a cloud resembling nothing, only itself, not chastity, not purity, not cotton, not whipped cream, itself. Who wanted other? I'm here. To see it, itself, entire. Here's some, some new ones. This one's, uh, what is called Hangman's Moon? I dream of horses on a nighttime road, dead silence riders astride. The moon would hide if it could when that pallid, pallid company travels together along this lane on white, white light. You might think the whole world's asleep. The horsemen kick free of their stirrups, dismount, mill for a moment and mutter. It seems there's an extra mount. Someone climbs haltingly into its saddle. Someone who thought himself a flower whose petals were destined to last. Someone who all through his gaudy life believed himself bright as blood. He too turns pale as a ghostly moonlight and gallops off with the rest. Someday, God, my wife won me, I tell you. Oh, somebody's, I better take this, somebody's trying to sell me my car warranty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
for the poem of the new book, What Shines. <clears throat> Astonishing its never-ending effort to have had a happy childhood. Why does it matter now? Why will yourself into all that forgetting? She may have been a good mother. At least she tried. Did she? Once again, you're the one who's trying. You contend you do remember moments of the glow. You picture her standing one day in the snow, her teeth in a chatter, no doubt, and yet she looked quite cheerful. <coughs> or she seemed to be trying, as you are. The teeth, at least, were one good feature, radiant to the end. You were poised at the top of the hill on a flexible flyer, red sled that shone your Christmas present at nine. It may have brought you joy. You're trying to alter the downslope slope rush to make it shiny too, to forget the icicles of snot, the raw fingers, chillblain, pain. The father was there, a good man, you've always believed, who's now no more than a specter, whose presence is no more advantageous than on that day. Or was it of some avail? You can't remember. You honestly can't remember. Perhaps you just don't want to. You're doing well. At least you're trying with this, your obstinate bid to winnow the damage and see if there's anything more than just the sorrow. Well, there were certain instances. You say, I remember stones. You say, I saw a beach by moonlight. And did those pebbles glint like stars, as you insist? Are you quite sure clouds never came to eclipse them? You keep on trying. There's that pervasive gleam along the shore. Then you take a step forward, and suddenly, there's nothing. Um, would be, I'll read two more short ones. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm lots of fun in real life, so let's try and uh, <laughs> find something. <laughs> this is called Suspension. Season of the Strawberry Moon, the Algonquins called it. The berries ripen in June. We see them along what's left of ancient tote roads. Some say rose me moon, some say hot. We won't be, but if we were forced to forage, those shy red baubles wouldn't start to stifle our hunger. If solitude can be shared, we share it here, in our cabin, deep in the woods. Don't ask where it is. There are gullible perch in the lake, under damp dust in the forest, bright worms for bait, we own a stable canoe. Rain dripped all day from the eaves, then blue broke through, exactly on time for moon to delete it. Our correctly portable radio says fair tomorrow, hot but pleasant, more good fortune. What did we do to deserve this? In a jagged row at our clearing's edge, wild roses glow like gemstones displayed on felt Mere minutes before the darkness yields the moonlight too, and they go wan. A damsel fell the fly kept drying its wings all afternoon on the wall beneath the eaves. It lifted just as dusk to hover briefly over its tiny world, the way we do over ours. And finally, another uh, patting poem, short one. This is a more scene, you know, where I'm not pretending I'm 24 out there with my tippy kayak. I uh, often go down the river and back uh, with my wife in a open canoe. And this remembers a moment of that kind to my wife's back. All naked but for a strap that traps my gaze as we paddle the dear familiar nubs of spine bone punctuating that sun-warmed sloth. 
the slender muscles that trouble the same sweet surface. We've watched and smiled as green herons flushed and hopped ahead at every bend. And we've looked up at the red tails tracing open script on the sky, so clear and deep we might believe it's autumn, no matter it's August still. Another fall will be on us before we know it. Of course, we adore that motion of color, but it seems to come again as soon as it's gone away. They all do now. My love for you over 40 years extends in all directions, but just now to your back as we drift and paddle down the people, Connecticut River. We've seen a mink spread fleas on a mudflat. We've seen an osprey start to die, but seeing us think better of it. And two CBs wagged on an ash limb. Your torso is long, can't see your legs, but they're longer, I know. Phoebe, osprey, heron, hawk. Marvel's under Black Mountain, but I'm fixed on your back indifferent to other wonders. <clears throat> Bright minnows that flared in the shallows, the gleam off that poor mink's coat, even the fleas in its fur, the various birds, the lusty creatures, just to survive. But I want you back. Never have I wished more not to die. Thank you. I think we're, we left some room in case anybody wanted to ask anything. Right. Well, provided it's polite because we're all poets and they're exquisitely <laughs> sensitive and weep. <laughs> Don't want to do it on camera. Right? Well, in that case, I don't want to ask you anything. <laughs> Just as well. <laughs> Others' poems. I, I just wonder if it would bring a different dimension to the poem. I'm, I'm just curious what you think about that. You watching your voice back? I think it would. Your eyes to yourself, though. Um, I think it would. Go ahead, Ralph. Well, I was going to say, one of the things I like to do when I read, which I didn't do today, it's the first time in a really long time, is read a poem by someone else, like start by reading a poem by someone else. And I actually I brought one of Barry's, uh, which I thought I would read, but I, I thought we were on kind of a, the reason why I didn't do it is because I thought we were in sort of a tight uh, time frame. But I think that's a, I think that's a terrific idea. and. I mean, I don't think there's any question, at least in my mind, that that each individual person would bring some other kind, some sort of nuance or energy to the poem that probably the poet, him herself, would not. Yeah, it's a really interesting. Idea. I, did, I was just thinking about it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You want to respond, Sam, or? Well, I was thinking about how different it is. You know, I'm a big fan of John Berryman. And at some point, I realized he was on YouTube. And I listened to some of his poems, and I thought, no, that's not right. <laughs> I know that poem by heart, his dresses are all wrong. So, <laughs> so it really is interesting, Carol, that people read your work. And you know, it's kind of a revelation. Yeah. Sort of like, for me, you know, I'm a big fan of Mary Louise Kelly's on NPR. And I wonder what she looks like. I had this picture of her. And I looked at her and I said, it's completely different. I said, I wish I'd never done that. Now I'm not <laughs> paying the same kind of attention as I should. But I, I think one of the things that uh, we underplay, or I can speak for myself at least, uh, as a recovering English teacher, is that the, uh, we, you know, we want to, it's as if poetry were made of something else than language. Whatever 
we put on there in a way of language, you peel out a way to see what the deeper meaning is. Whereas it's really a physical art in many ways. I mean, lyric comes from playing the lyre and singing it, so it's a column of air coming up, putting something into the room. And I know that uh, I make myself recite my own poetry to myself when I think it's finished. And if I get to a phase where I'm kind of mumbling my way through, I say, well, it's not finished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. I don't think I've ever, I, I did have a weirder question once, you know, with, are those real poems or did you make them up? Which was a <laughs> very hard one to understand, but a long answer. <laughs> That's, I, I love what you said, Sam, though, about, about, you mentioned Merriman specifically, because I've had that same experience, too, where I've, I've heard, um, and, and not just poetry, but prose and fiction as well, when I hear, I've heard uh, the author read something that I really loved, and I just wanted to go, no, that's just not right. <laughs> it's not the way that I heard it. Right. And it's almost like, um, when I was, when I was driving down from Burlington, I was listening to the radio, as uh, I'm, I'm always doing, um, and heard a couple of, I was listening to, um, what was it? Anyway, it was some serious XM station. The point is that they did, the DJ did a, a little stint of songs where the original artist did it, and then it was followed by a couple of cover versions of the song. And the thing that is so cool about that, and sort of goes back to you know your original question, is like how 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 great the cover versions can be, and still be so different from the original version, and and how the cover versions can be so different from each other as well as from the original version. So yeah, it's a really it's a really good idea. I wondered if, oh, oh go ahead. Um, if you, and I don't know where Sam went. Um, she got it. Uh, I'll be, I'll be oh, Okay. Um, have any wisdom or thoughts or humor to impart about um, the drive to continue writing poetry as we age? What your thoughts are about? Well, in my case, it's all fame and money and women. <laughs> you can't beat the money. <laughs> I don't know. There's I, no beating the money. I just can't stop doing it. That, that's all. I mean, I don't need a drive. You know, people say, well, you have some discipline. You sit down and the discipline is to go pick up the grandkids. The writing is nothing. <laughs> that's just what I do. That's great. It, it's the only way I know to make sense of things, so yeah. Yeah. I do it. You know, I hope that people like it. That'd be good. But I do it because I understand things better mm. if I'm writing about it. Yeah. And I'm doing, you know, I, th I think about the thing Sid said. Like you're reading this thing out loud that you, you've written. You think, oh, no, that's a dead zone. That's not what I really felt or meant. Yeah. So yeah. it really is a, so you understand more about being alive. And of course, which does change as you age tremendously. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's that it, it's it isn't so much the the drive to write itself that changes, but but the subject matter has really changed. You know, the, the material has yeah. really changed, and I think that has a lot to do with with aging. And, you know. I, I remember somebody saying saying to me um, many years ago when I was a kid, uh, something like, you should just be you should just be in love and pissed off all the time. Because that's where the best the, your best poems are all about being in love and being pissed off. And now it's I'm and now I'm in love and hardly ever pissed off. Uh, and and so it's I'm just kind of stuck with the old with, with that old chestnut. And um, and the other thing is and, and it's the biggest chestnut of them all is the whole mortality thing. I mean, as I've gotten older, I mean, I, with Norman, Doody, and Barry, just in, within the last two months, uh, and you know, we all have, I think, that sort of familiar sense of 
you know, I mean, if we live long enough, we're going to lose people that we really love and care about. And, um, and that has a very interesting way of reflecting back on how we feel about, you know, what we, what we have left, you know, like how much time we have. And so that, that's certainly become an occupation, if not a preoccupation, in the last couple of years. Really. You know, that uh, press rehearsal for death I mentioned, that, that changed me in a way, you know. I mean, I, oh, I yeah. think I was yeah. more death obsessed when I was in my 40s than I am now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, it's coming and nobody, Mother Nature is undefeated. I don't have any illusions <laughs> about that. But I don't sit around thinking, well, gee, I'm 80, so, you know, life yeah. expectancy for my, I just don't right. do it. Yeah. Uh, and I was interested in what Sam said because I, it, I think it's akin to what I've, often told people, so I, uh, I write to find out what I didn't know was on my mind. Mm -hmm. And I also write to find out what I didn't know I knew. Yeah. Is that yeah. hard to, uh, I don't know, that's hard to explain, but geez, I'm, I'm aware of that, and I've been aware of it for a long time, but I haven't been aware of the fact that I'm aware, that I'm aware of it, you know? Uh, yeah. right. it's, and it's the discovery, I find. That's why I think, you know, people have programmatic views toward poetry. Um, I like political poetry. Even when the, even when the politics are politics, I agree with. So this person knew where she was going before she wrote the poem. So there are no surprises here. Right. You know, why don't you write a letter to the editor and then write a poem which contains that animus or that emotion mm -hmm. against a certain recently happily sequestered or not yet. I, is a god. Um, and why don't you incorporate that into the poem without being odd hominem or odd feminine, you know? And just to take off from what's already been said, I often find that um, in the process of writing, I discover that I, that what I believed I thought about something, mm. it, it turns out is not what I think at all. You know, I actually. Think. I actually think something completely different. So it's yeah, you have to let interesting you, to yeah, You have to let yourself be honest because we all have an inborn sense. I, I know, you know, you don't have to show it to anybody, but is that really the way I, I is that really my take on the situation? Like, that's shameful, but that's, <laughs> it's genuine. Right. To put it back in the drawer and then, then, or burn it if you don't want your kids discover it. But, uh, yeah, don't, yeah. don't become a memoirist. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta let it go. Honesty is so rare that finding that in any piece yeah, of work. That's so true. That's a great one liner. <laughs> it's just a great thing that you, you can do in writing or in painting or but to create something honest that does say what you feel, the complexity of it. Mm. Yeah. I, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and I and I I can fudge it. But the only I used to have a whole slew of people with whom I shared my poems, including Barry. Uh, and uh, but I don't anymore. Only, only my wife, who is not, uh, she's a, not a literary person, though very highly literate, but she knows me really well. And, uh, you know, <laughs> she writes, uh, you know, snag, new age, sensitive new age guy. I know you better than that. You, you know, I gotta get changed that. That's <laughs> not, Come on. <laughs> and uh, though it's humiliating, it's uh, chastening in a proper way. I just had a, um, a thought because, of, you know, the first thing about having somebody else read your poetry, et cetera, and so forth. I, I, I think I'm a classic poet, but the, as a reader of poetry, which I have always done, um, what I like about that experience is that the poem, when I read it, is no longer your poem. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that reading of the poem just transfers into, you know, the experiencing all of that. I, I've never really been all that interested in the poets, the poets. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what happens when that goes into my brain and yeah. becomes I, part of my molecular yeah. No, that's theory. really good. So really good that. And, you know. It becomes public property in that sense. Yes. You know? right. have, no, you've got that all wrong. Well, you don't have it all wrong. You have it right by, by uh, your life. Yeah. 
And I think that, and, uh, I once wrote an essay and I still stand by it. I think there, in almost every case, I write a poem, there's a hidden allegory in it. And it's hidden even from me. You know what I mean? I really do. Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote a long poem after my younger brother who had a, 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 a tortured life. He died a cocaine addict when he was very young. And uh, I didn't write for like six months uh, after he died. We had a very twisted relationship. And I, you know, and then he's gone. And he's like, well, what was that all about? You know, that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden I sat down, I wrote the longest poem I've ever written, 15 pages. I never stopped. I just kept going. I kept going. I kept going. I like called the feud, and it's about, you know, a couple of neighbors. And then it escalates. And finally the narrator, who thinks he's just, you know, God's gift to the earth, uh, his house burns down and he loses a child in the fire. It's not a happy poem. Hmm. And, uh, and I, when I got done writing it, I was kind of like shaking. I mean, this just came. And I said, well, you know, it could be any good Puritan. I said, well, this can't be anything good. It, just came. it was too easy. And I bet I didn't change more than 10 words in that poem, no lie. Whereas I'm an obsessive reviser, as a rule. And I came to think later on that the allegory of that poem was you warded yourself over your brother. You were the good guy. You know, he did everything wrong. You did everything right. And now what? You know? Now what? I think that's why it came in such a rush. I had no idea that when I was doing it. And I may be wrong even in that construal, but it, it sort of makes sense to me that that might have been the, might have been the case. Yeah. And Mark, to back to what you said um, about, I mean, if I, I'm just paraphrasing, but it, it, sort of a sense of ownership. Like when I, when I read the work of poets I really love, I feel like I've taken that in almost the way that you would like eat a meal or something like that. And then you just kind of assimilate that and it becomes a part of you and there's there's no and and, and even I, I sometimes will hear in the, even these kinds of sessions people um, being asked, well could you sort of explain what you meant by something? And you know it, it's, it, and then the person goes on talking about what they what they meant or thought they meant, and I feel like tapping them on the shoulder and say, "No, you got it all wrong." <laughs> it might be your poem, but it's my poem now, and I I know damn well what you actually. Meant. Jack, did you want to say something way back? Yeah, uh, I write stories. I try to write stories, and it seems to me that I've been trying to write the same stories and get them right for decades. Right? And, and I can't. Uh, it's difficult, very difficult. And uh, today, listen to Sam, Ralph, Sidney, listening to you guys read your work. I had a, what might be an insight, a practical consideration and, and that is a, maybe a sure sense of what I can get rid of if the work was unnecessary. Mm. <laughs> and my experience with reading poetry and uh, friends who are poets and read that work, that uh, poets means with narrative uh, is, is very, very powerful. So thanks. Thank you. I think we've used up our slot or have we not? What's well, after 1.30? I think they were, they were saying an hour or so. We've been here for 65 minutes. <laughs> thank you all for yes, coming. Thanks for coming. Really. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. <laughs>